um, out of out of many faiths, religious diversity in the American Promise, to which uh, Lori is a contributor, has focused largely on the American civic landscape um, as a place of interfaith interaction. Uh, I have highlighted places like hospitals and public parks and social services agencies and college campuses as the kind of civic spaces where most people can agree that that important work is being done. Uh, nobody ever uh, uh, says, you, you know, we shouldn't have health or education or, or leisure um, uh, and where people bring their diverse religious identities to that space in a meaningful way. And, you know, of course, if you think about an American hospital, the range of people who are inspired to become healers because of their, their, uh, their faith commitment and, and the complexity that it looks like to cooperate across religious differences in, in a space in which uh, religion is salient, often because there are cosmic things happening from births to sickness to death. So one of the, the paragraphs that I write in the introduction to interfaith leadership, we will, by the way, send this to you uh, after the, the call today. We wanted you to focus on Lori's writings before this call, and I'll send a couple of mine out right after. But uh, I fears from the introduction of, of interfaith leadership. When I use the term civic <laughs> interfaith landscape, I mean the various spaces, schools, parks, college campuses, companies, organizations, libraries, sports leagues, hospitals, where people who orient around religion differently interact with one another with varying degrees of ignorance and understanding, tension and connection, division and cooperation, when their faith identities are implicated by that interaction. When I say civic interfaith work, I mean the kinds of activities and conversations that through addressing diverse faith identities and interaction, strengthen a religiously diverse democracy. An interfaith leader is someone expert in organizing these. One of the ideas for the field of interfaith studies is that just as nursing produces nurses and just as uh, public health as a field produces uh, people who work in public health, interfaith studies and the courses that make it up and the scholarship that makes it up would produce people who view themselves as interfaith leaders, who would be, as I write here, uh, uh, expert in the kinds of activities and conversations that through addressing diverse faith identities and interactions strengthen a religiously diverse democracy. So I begin with that because while that is the, the focus of the last 10 years of the work uh, and the kind of civic interfaith organization that IFYC has become, the focus of the first 10 years and the reason that I became kind of ignited about interfaith cooperation at all has everything to do with racial justice. And it is a different uh, and extremely interesting uh, conversation at some point to have uh, how the work took a turn towards the civic uh, rather than uh, uh, continued on into the areas, into deep areas of racial justice. Um, but the recovery of that for me is, uh, is not hard um, because it's, it's a central part of my own formation. And as I said, it was the, the very reason I became interested in the first place. And so because we are witness to, uh, and I stand in awe of um, uh, a movement that has just totally changed the space, um, totally changed the space around race in America that has been building for 10 years plus 390, um, uh, and in, in whose light we now all live. Right, we all live. All of us, from you know Jeff Bezos to Roger Goodell, now live in the new space and the new light of the Black Lives Matter movement. I wanted to to center again what brought me to interfaith work to begin with. This is in part my own story, and I think it is something that is is the kind of uh, um, the kind of thing that, that would be of great interest to students and is teachable in a pretty straightforward way. And I wanted to do it through just four images. And so we'll begin with the, the first one here, Carolyn. So this, of course, is uh, the most iconic image from one of the marches from Selma to Montgomery. And it's interesting to note, of course, that, that there wasn't just one, that there were several marches or at least several attempts at marches um, but this is probably amongst the most iconic images. And of course, there's Dr. King in the center there, 
Uh, there's a, um, what I believe is a Catholic uh, sister, a couple of places to Dr. King's left, uh, uh, actually Dr. King's right, my left and your left. And there is uh, the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a couple of people over on the other side. And part of what this image encapsulates for me is the interfaith dimension of the movement for racial justice that we refer to as the civil rights movement. Um, and just, just take the center of the movement in the center of this picture for a second. I remember somebody saying to me in college, you know, we know a lot about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We never talk about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And that was a major like scales falling from my eyes moment. And perhaps it isn't for any of you on this call, but, but it, it might actually be for some of your students because King's Christianity is absolutely central to the person, to, he, to his person and to the figure he cuts in civil rights work. And so as I read more deeply into this, and of course, the story that I'm telling is in part the story of how I come to interfaith work and I come to, to think religion is really inspiring and exciting. You know, King says things like, many people want to make of me many things, but in the deep recesses of my heart, I'm a Christian minister, I'm a Baptist minister. I'm the grandson of a Baptist, I'm the son of a Baptist minister, I'm the grandson of a Baptist minister, and my commitment to Jesus as the son of the living God is the highest commitment that I have, higher than race or nation or creed, right? And I remember reading this in college and thinking, I, you know, how come I didn't know anything about this, right? Um, and that begins kind of my exploration, not just of King's deep religious conviction and the role that that plays in his in his uh, understand, in his kind of images of civil rights work and, and his, his commitment and inspiration to do it, but also the religious dimension of the civil rights movement writ large. And of course, one of those is standing right there in the form of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. So uh, Rabbi Heschel misses the trains running from, from uh, uh, Warsaw to Auschwitz by six weeks. And basically his entire family dies in Hitler's hellfires in, in Europe. Uh, and in much of his community, right, uh, in in unspeakable fashion, and and I often think to myself, if there's if there's anybody in the United States who gets to say, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna focus on quote unquote my own people, it might have been Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, having made it out of Warsaw to the Jewish Theological Seminary on the Upper West Side of New York in the middle part of the 20th century. But instead, as we all know, he doesn't just focus on his own people. He decides, which is to say, uh, um, the Jewish people. He decides that in his, in his language, the soul of Judaism is at stake in the civil rights movement. And he comes to Chicago in 1963 to speak at and be witness to King's speech at the Chicago Conference on Religion and Race. And that begins um, a long friendship and partnership with King on civil rights work. And this is probably the most iconic image of that. If my, if my memory of American history and King's biography serves me correctly, uh, on the day that King is tragically martyred, uh, uh, he is actually on his way, uh, April, of course, April 4th, 1968, he's on his way to celebrate Passover with, with Rabbi Heschel. And so Rabbi Heschel is a, just a, just a uh, it's impossible to overstate his partnership with King in this work and, and the way that he brings a Jewish commitment to it. Um, and it, that's not the only part of the, that's not the only dimension of kind of the interfaith threads through, through the, uh, the civil rights movement. In King's own life, of course, Gandhi plays a central role. King writes himself in his autobiography that in the Montgomery bus boycott, Jesus is the inspiration, but Gandhi uh, furnishes the method. King is so uh, taken by the example of Mahatma Gandhi, he goes to India in 1959. Um, uh, he, um, uh, witnesses that Gandhi Satyagraha movement in India is not just a Hindu movement, but it's a, a remarkably interfaith movement. Um, this is a little bit of a, um, uh, a highlight of that. So, so there's Gandhi, uh, and the person in front of him, of course, is Jawaharlal Nehru, who uh, what people will recognize as probably the most important uh, Gandhian protege, but might not know that Nehru was a pretty staunch secular humanist. He was not by any means a religious Hindu, and he was very, very clear about that. Uh, and yet he would consider Gandhi probably his leading light, and Gandhi would consider him his leading protege, right? And so you've got this kind of great Hindu figure giving rise to the first prime minister of India, who is a pretty proud secular humanist. Behind 
Mahatma Gandhi is, is a gentleman named Bacha Khan. He is part of the Pashtun tribe of Afghanistan, which incidentally is uh, where the Taliban comes from. He's known as the frontier Gandhi, and he has a deep Muslim Quranic commitment to nonviolence. And there are these stories and images of Gandhi and, and uh, 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 Bacha Khan in villages in India, reading alternately from the Bhagavad Gita and the Holy Quran uh, when Hindu and Muslim riots start to break out. And this is just one small example of kind of the interfaith dimensions of what's known as Hind Swaraj or the, or the movement to liberate India. In Gandhi's own life, there are many powerful interfaith threads. And so Gandhi is deeply moved by the Sermon on the Mount, which he reads as a law student in London. He also le reads the Russian Christian uh, Leo Tolstoy's work. He's so taken by Tolstoy that he names an ashram, Tolstoy Farm. Uh, and so Gandhi, as deep as his commitment to Hinduism is, like King after him, uh, you know, Gandhi, of course, nourishes King. Gandhi himself is nourished in many ways by different religions. I just spoke with a Baha'i friend of mine who said, you know, Gandhi had many, had many beautiful things to say about the Baha'i tradition. One of my favorite Gandhian lines is that, um, uh, one ought, it is good for one to be in the home of one's own religion, but the window should be open to let in the winds of, of the wisdom of other religions, right? And again, the reason I say this is, is both because it is a matter of historical record, therefore kind of, you know, uh, uh, a part of scholarship uh, that, that people who oriented around religion differently came together in these movements for religious justice. I also say this because this is how I got involved to begin with. And I start to get involved in interfaith work around the times I'm around 19, 20, 21 years old. It was a moment in American life that had a broad uh, um, parallel to what we're experiencing today uh, because it was in the aftermath of the heinous Rodney King beating. And I was interested in racial justice. I thought it was the most important thing that was happening in America. Uh, and I realized that there is this major interfaith component to all of these racial justice movements that in my mind, nobody was talking about, but that connected with me in a deep way as I was on my own path to come back to Islam. Uh, and I thought to myself, the movements that I want to be a part of in the future are movements for racial justice. And I want to be part of the interfaith thread of those movements in the same way that these folks were. So I can go back one slide to the Mandela slide. So uh, one of the kind of Kairos moments of my life was uh, 1999, uh, Parliament of the World's Religions, Cape Town, South Africa. I see Mandela speak and Mandela, the first words out of his mouth uh, are, I would still be there. He's pointing to the Cape and specifically towards Robben Island where he spent, you know, 27 years of his life. He's saying, I would still be there if it wasn't for the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews and the African traditionalists and the Baha'is and the Buddhists and the humanists of South Africa coming together in the movement against apartheid. And I have this kind of moment, you know, being in South Africa at, at the turn of the millennium, the struggle was an interfaith movement. And Muslims, and this is why I wanted to depict this picture as male, as unfortunately male as it is, is Muslims play a key role in that movement. And, you know, I grew up in an professional middle class immigrant Ismaili Muslim household. And I basically thought that like becoming a professional uh, along the lines of accountant, doctor, engineer was like so central in my house. You could, you would have thought it was in the Quran. That's how like, that's how much my parents kind of pushed that. And to be in South Africa and to meet Farid Esak, who later marries me, and Rashid Omar, and Ibrahim Rasul, and Ibrahim Musa, who Lori also knows, and to realize that these people, like their commitment to Islam made them front and center in, in the struggle against apartheid at Mandela's side, just changes my life. It changes my life. Um, the struggle in South Africa is also an interfaith movement. And of course, from Gandhi to King and King to Mandela, that is not a hard arc to recreate, right? It, that, that, is, that, is a, that is like the arc of righteousness in the 20th century. And we'll go to the last slide I've got. Um, that's my first faith hero. That's Dorothy Day, you know, 
probably in her 70s, uh, looking utterly convicted at a couple of uh, what I imagine to be um, uh, uh, slightly intimidated police officers. Uh, I think that this is in California at a farm workers uh, um, march or demonstration, if, if my memory serves me correctly, but this is my first faith hero. This is reading about Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement, and I ended up spending a summer in Catholic worker houses and actually living in the Catholic worker house here in Chicago after I graduated from college. This is when I thought to myself, faith is about doing justice and being, and doing justice because that is how God would want us to live. And even though I never wanted to convert to Catholicism, the wisdom and inspiration that I got from Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement is, it, it, I, there is no way for me to overstate that. Uh, and it is that set of kind of experiences, right? Um, the time in the Catholic Worker Movement, the recognition of of King being principally a reverend and, and not a doctor, if you will, if you kind of take the, the poeticness of that, um, the the interfaith thread, uh, uh, actually thread is too, too slight of a way to put it, the interfaith center of a lot of the most inspiring movements of, of the past 50 or 60 years, um, that, is, that is how I got to be a part of interfaith work. That was a huge part of IFYC in its, in its first 10 years. And as we move on to Lori's presentation and speak of being theorists of a public square uh, and the eruptive public square, part of what I am interested in exploring is how do we join the civic and, and the, the spaces that we might think of as civic and the spaces that we might think of as focused on justice, especially when we know that different religious traditions have different definitions of justice. Thank you, Ibu. Calvin, I, I welcome you to talk next. Hi again, everybody. Ibu, thank you for, for those comments, for those reflections and remarks. Um, what I am going to briefly talk about um, is what I'm calling teaching to transgress. Teaching to transgress dismantling white supremacy with interfaith perspectives. Um, but before we dive in, a lot of what I'll be talking about in the former half of my time is sort of foundational elements, things that some of us probably already know, probably all of us know. Um, but it's, a, it's good to start with shared and common language, um, not just for our time now, but for our times in the future. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm happy to, to share these things with you so we can, uh, we can go to, to the next slide, Carolyn. So, Teaching to transgress, I want to talk about really foundational elements of what of what we've been experiencing in this country for the past 400 years or so. And so, like I said, a, a good bit of this will be sort of foundational, but it's good that we start here. So there are many different definitions of, of racism that we can pull from, some from economics, some from the social sciences, others from the humanities. And what I want to do is I wanted to pull two definitions that really get at uh, sort of the the intersections of sort of racism, classism, and the other sort of modes of oppression that that are that exist in this country. So uh, we define racism um, as a systematic allocation of goods, privileges, benefits, and rights advantaging white people. Uh, defined as a systematic allocation of goods, privileges, benefits, and rights advantaging white people. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins, a black feminist scholar, puts it another way. A system of unequal power and privilege where humans are divided into groups or races with social rewards unevenly distributed to groups based on their racial classification. And so when we, those two definitions I, I like because it, it moves away from how in the public square we tend to talk about racism as sort of individual biases, individual modes of living, what, what happens in, in your head and your heart. And all of that is also true. And at the same time, racism is institutional, racism is structural, racism is systemic. And what all of that comes together to produces white supremacy as the dominant social system in the United States white supremacy as the do dominant social system in the United States. We can go to, to the next slide. So uh, anti-Black racism 
then is a primary feature of white supremacy, right? And so as whiteness is being codified in the early 20th century in the courts, it was being defined against blackness. The degree to which your race deviates away from whiteness determined your racial place in the social order. And so with blackness being antithetical to whiteness, that's how models of, that's how narratives of model minorities were formed and shaped. And so it's important that we really start there and understand that racism it's structural and institutional. We say these words and we say all of these phrases that sound good and that are true, but a lot of times we don't actually talk about what that means and what that looks like. And so as race, as I said, is being defined in the courts in the 1920s, 1930s, as sweeping immigration is happening and then being paused, um, we're really starting to understand just how after slavery, after emancipation, white supremacy continues to be the dominant mode of, of the social order. And so since racism and white supremacy are systemic, structural and institutional, our solutions to these things must attend to the system structures and institutions, especially the ones that we contribute to and are a part of, primarily for our time together now, the academy, the spaces where students come to be shaped and formed. And if they are being shaped and formed at universities that were also created in a white supremacist environment, then a lot of the ways in which we do what we do is formed and shaped by white supremacist thought. And so uh, that, you know, I first started to learn about racism in this way in graduate school at Emory University. And even as a young black man, that that was, I wouldn't say hard for me to accept, but I definitely hit a wall in my own sort of understanding of what racism was, although I had experienced it pretty, pretty much all of my life as a young black man, as a child, as a young black child as well, learning about just how deeply entrenched racism and white supremacy is in our systems, in our structures, in our institutions. Is, is important. And so even as we talk about solutions, we must attend to the ways in which these systems and structures compound to create particularly particular experiences of oppression. And so I'm thinking of other systems and structures such as racism, capitalism, um, ableism, gender bias, Islamophobia, et cetera, right? All of these things don't exist in a vacuum. I don't experience racism at one point and then experience um, sort of classism and capitalism at another point, right? As a young black man who grew up in the inner city of Chicago, I experienced those things together. And so we must attend to the ways in which these sort of systems compound and come together to create particular experiences, which is why I remember I was teaching um, a class called Black Love at Emory in the College of Arts and Sciences while I was in graduate school there. And um, it was a class of about, I would say 90 students, and I would say 98% of those students were black. And uh, a lot of the tension that existed in that space over the course of our semester, by the way, this is also the fall of 2016, and we know what happens in you know November of 2016, uh, current administration is elected. And so um, I'm, I'm saying this to say, I remember the ways in which uh, students, were pretty much at each other's heads. And I'm particularly thinking of black male or male identifying students and black women students, because a lot of the young black women were trying to get young black men to understand that they experience a unique type of oppression because it's racism and misogyny and sexism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that creates a particular experience for them in this country that I wouldn't have as a young black male. And so as we're teaching and as we're thinking about the how do we navigate those type of dynamics in our classroom, we must tend to the ways in which, as I said, these systems and structures compound and come together and come on top of each other to create unique experiences that we have to tend to. You can go to the next slide, Carolyn. And so James Cone, uh, the, the founder of Black Liberation Theology, one of my biggest, biggest heroes 
and um, scholarly influences once said, what difference does it make that one should prove a philosophical point if that point has nothing to do with spreading freedom throughout the land? And this is, is jarring for me. It, just, it moves me because as I think about my own role and as we think about our role together as pedagogues, what are we aiming towards, right? What, what are we moving towards? What are we teaching towards? Which is why I wanted to title this presentation, Teaching to Transgress, because our teaching has to be about freedom. Uh, the writer Bell Hook says, uh, teaching as a practice of freedom, uh, education as a practice of freedom. And so as I think about how the role James Cone plays, both in the Black church, but also in the wider sphere of the of religious America and Christian America, I think about this quote and I think about the ways in which our teaching must, must move towards freedom, must move toward liberation. And so it is not enough, we can go to the next slide, it is not enough to simply be not racist, right? You must be anti-racist. And I'm sure that this is a phrase that I've heard in, in many different uh, in many different spaces in the public square and public conversations, you know, within the past three or four weeks or so. And I really want us to, 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 to meditate on it and to think on that, that it's not enough to simply be not racist, but you must actively put your intention and attention to dismantling systems and structures that perpetuate or advance white supremacy. And for, for us, it starts home, but, we, but it moves to our campuses, it moves to our classrooms. And so what does this look like for us? I, I, as we move into that for my final remarks, what, what, what could this look like for us? For a lot of us who are religion scholars and, and professors, we have to have a critical examination of Christian privilege in the ways in which religion, especially Christianity, reinforce white supremacy. Um, this could look like a, a, a ton of different things. Who's in your, for, for example, who's in your canon? Who are the authoritative voices that you lift up, that your students hear? I also think about how, you know, growing up, I didn't receive education about King that taught me about his critiques of imperialism, capitalism, and militarism, right? And I'm thinking about how this plays how this plays with the concept of, of intersectionality as the, the scholar Kimberly Crenshaw defines it, the, who coined the term. Um, imperialism, capitalism, and militarism come together to create not just a, a unique type of oppression for African Americans, Black Americans, and other people of color in the United States, but around the world. When you think about the United States presence and our role in the dismantling of, of governments across, across the world. We have to really think about how King uses his specific religious voice, as Ibu said, King as a reverend and not just King as a doctor, to critique these. And that, that leads on to an honest account of the effects of chattel slavery in the United States and its current legacy. When we talk about policing and slave patrols and we're talking about police brutality, we have to have a critical examination of the ways in which slavery um, is, is still in effect today and what we would call the, the criminal justice system or the prison industrial complex. And the, the scholar Michelle Alexander, who is a visiting professor now at Union Theological Seminary in New York, uh, her, her book title, uh, The New Jim Crow, talks a lot about this. And she has specific religious voices who lift up just how our prison system um, is both uh, uh, a sort of a stain against our suppose and and profess Christian heritage in this country. And so this is what the, these things look like in our in our classrooms. Um, you go to the next slide, Carolyn. Um, as I think about uh, the role of religion and the role of re religious voices and scholars, I automatically think about Malcolm X who sits outside of what scholars typically call the civil rights movement. He's particularly in the Black Power movement, right? And those things sit adjacent to one another and intersect in many different ways, but they do have very distinct philosophies. And I think about how um, Malcolm, um, 
Malcolm X says, there's nothing in our book, the Quran, that teaches us to suffer peacefully, right? He's using his specific religious voice to talk about uh, what's happening in the, in the 60s and, of course, be before then. He says, our religion teaches us to be intelligent, to be peaceful, to be courteous, to obey the law, to respect everyone. But he goes on to have other comments. Uh, this is when he's talking to um, it's a message to a grassroots activist in November 1963 in Detroit. Um, he's saying that there's nothing in, 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 the, in the book, and he's talking about the Quran, that teaches us to suffer peacefully, meaning there's nothing that teaches us to take racism and other modes of oppression peacefully, right? And so he's using his specific religious voice uh, to, to, to land to, to lend itself to, to freedom and to, and to liberation. And I think for so long, we have been taught that teaching, especially teaching religion, should be purely descriptive, right? But that's part of the framework, I believe, that upholds and perpetuates white supremacy because the ways in which many of us were taught to teach and to teach religion specifically and even other subjects in the humanities was created and taught in a white supremacist environment. And so when I talk about um, teaching to transgress. I'm thinking about how we live in the most religiously diverse nation in the world, as Ibu said earlier, as some scholars have said, and we know younger generations are becoming less and less interested in organized religion. So then how do we teach religion in a way that students see the cultural value of it, how it's applicable to what they're living in their day-to-day -day lives? How do we teach in a way that shows students religion is not irrelevant, it's not some archaic ancient concept that our that our ancestors and forefounders um, were interested in, but it has something to, to say to the now. So here are just some questions to consider. Of course, you can, we'll send this, I'll send these questions out afterwards in our follow-up. But pedagogically and instructionally, what voices do you privilege and what stories are considered history? How do you help students reimagine a world not based on white supremacist cultural norms? Uh, what organizations do you privilege when suggesting service projects and internships? And do they have a commitment to racial justice and equity? And then finally, the last slide, even personally, being an anti-racist, what actions do you take to support the equity efforts on your campus? How often do you advocate fiercely for academic departments and co-curricular programs that teach, promote, and advance equity, justice, and inclusion? And finally, how often do you continue to educate yourself on anti-Black racism and the experiences of your Black colleagues and students? And so this is a conversation, obviously, that will continue. I'm happy to, to be in conversation with you, of course, throughout the summer as you are building your classes and programs online. Thank you, Calvin. And to Lori. You're muted, Lori. Yeah. There we Thank go. you so much, both Ibu and Calvin. Um, incredibly thoughtful. And uh, wanted to just say when we all three of us met and we talked about how we were going to think through the question of interfaith work um, and anti racist work, um, I began to think about the ways in which uh, the Who Owns Religion book began to address some of these questions, um, but it doesn't do so as directly as Calvin and Ibu just did. Um, it comes up in a number of different contexts, both colonial and post-colonial contexts in the book, um, but I think um, it comes out most strongly and most focused in the um, definition that Calvin just gave about the systematic allocation of goods, privileges, benefits, and rights advantaging white people in the Sam Gill case study. And so um, I chose that case study as a way for us to think through those questions. Um, and I want to say at the beginning, um, and this is something I think that was part of the worldviews and ways of thinking that both Ibu and Calvin suggested just now, um, that attending to the particularity of experience um, is absolutely crucial. And so um, the book does not attend to the particularity of Black experience. Uh, 
Um, but the case study on the Mother Earth book does attend more to the particularity of Native American experience. And I was thinking about which case study would be the most helpful for us to think about racial justice and equity um, given where we are today and given the aftermath of George Floyd and so many others murders and um, the heartbreak uh, that so many of us are feeling again um, around what's happening in this country. Um, so what I thought I'd do is share with you um, I think something that has, as I think about it, a kind of um, racial element to it, motivation to it um, in our country, which is the fragility of the public square. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I wrote the book, um, how this the book emerged, um, and then um, <clears throat> connect with some of the remarks that Ibu and Calvin just made in relationship to that question and that concept. Um, so um, as you may remember from the introduction, a part of this work came about because um, a public square whose rules we thought we knew had broken open. Um, it came about for me personally um, with the story that I shared in the introduction of a Hindu scholar, um, Paul Courtright being attacked by um, a group of uh, Hindus in the United States, which then became a global movement. Um, and um, a lot of the rejection of his work, critique of his work, had to do with the colonial and neo-colonial context in which the book was written. Um, and it sparked a, a very big debate. Um, and I found myself trying to manage it through the legal offices at where Calvin used to be, um, Emory University, when I was chair of the religion department there. And um, I realized that we just didn't have the language for figuring out how to deal with this. Um, and no graduate student was ever trained to think about these questions. And so um, what I really felt responsible for as chair of the religion department then later, um, as uh, the inaugural director of the Center for Faculty Development at um, Emory, so faculty development to Carolyn's earlier point is absolutely in my blood. Um, and then at Duke at the Dean of Arts and Sciences and now as president of Middlebury is in each increasing role that I had, I was responsible more and more for that public sphere, for the, um, the decency, civility, all those words that are being questioned now as functions and tools of a white supremacist culture. Um, and yet still there's something in them uh, for me that means something. And I, the term that I still use in this space is respect. Um, and uh, that's something that has been deeper and deeper uh, sense of responsibility that I have for those things. Um, and so I wanted to write this book. It took me 14 years to write this book. I wrote many other books and articles and other things in between. And part of the reason why I didn't, couldn't finish it um, is for two reasons. One is um, the world kept changing. And every time I thought I was done with the uh, scandals and controversies, another one would come. And I realized after a certain point that, and my editor kept saying in 2003 and four, when I started this, he kept saying, okay, you better hurry up. Um, you know, these are gonna get old pretty soon. And finally I realized, you know what? I'm gonna take so long that we're gonna do intellectual history instead. Um, and that's exactly what I, I did is, is write a piece about the 90s when this emerged with a pace and intensity that it hadn't before. Um, and, and I think I'm very glad that I took as long as I did. Um, I immersed myself in theories of the public square, particularly critiques of Habermas and ideas about what it means to be in a public square. Um, Habermas, as you know, has an idealized view of the public sphere, square in which um, people who might be religious and people who are non-religious can um, work through reason, building on Richard Rorty and many other uh, philosophers, 
to a space where religion's reasons become transparent. Um, and you can see reading that even in the 90s, you know, that that could be a very interesting way to approach this. Um, but the critiques of, of Habermas in this space, particularly around religion, are twofold. Number one, and this is sort of central to Ibu and Calvin's work as well as what they shared with you today, which is why should a religious person in the public sphere translate? Why should we have to translate into rationality um, in order to be comprehensible? And it's a very good question. And the answer could be because that's the only language of the public square. Um, and all of the case studies of the book are places where that rationality of the public square um, wasn't sufficient. Um, and uh, it becomes a, a place of eruption because the rules that apply no longer can apply. Um, people are literally speaking two different languages and um, it's not just that they don't understand each other, but something's at stake and nothing can be followed. No rule can be followed in terms of conduct. Um, and so the name for it that I coined, as you saw, was um, the eruptive public space. Notice that I don't say sphere, I say space, because a sphere implies a certain kind of ordered nature to it. And an eruptive public is one where um, usually two goods, um, the right of a people to represent themselves, um, and the right of a scholar uh, to academic freedom come into direct, um, eruptive, and in certain cases, violent conflict with each other. So this is a book about the academy um, and the critiques of the academy that Calvin referred to, um, uh, both racial, religious, colonial, post-colonial, and so on. Um, and it was a, a series of controversies that really pointed out I think for um, some of the first times, the space of privilege, and in this case, we might want to say white privilege, that the academy was, um, and yet at the same time, um, thinking through the question of how a scholar can and should be free to pursue um, their own intellectual agenda. Um, and so um, the the thing that I think, you know, the eruptive public does is always, not always, but pretty close a surprise. Um, suddenly it's there, it's startling. Um, it may be something that someone expected, maybe even long-term, but it tends to be sort of overwhelmingly startling. Um, and as I chose my six cases that occurred in the late 80s and early 90s, um, it was really clear to me that, um, religious communities and racial identities did overlap in many of these cases. Um, the Sikh case, I chose a Catholic case, a Sikh case, a Hindu case, a Jewish case, a Muslim case, and a Native American case. Um, and certainly the Sikh and Hindu cases, as well as the Ismaili cases, have racial compo components to them. Um, I'm a South Asianist, so many of the ones that I lived or lived with friends indirectly uh, three of them were related to South Asia in some way or other. Um, but one of the things that I tried to do in the book was to write about these cases in such a way um, that um, even though I knew very well what my own position was um, or where I identified with folks, I also felt um, that it was very important to um, uh, be aware of where my own empathies were. Um, so I tried to write in a, um, not in a neutral way, because that was impossible, but in a reasoned, careful way, which tried to honor all of the different points of view that were there. Um, the one case that was impossible for me to do that, interestingly, was not the one that I lived most closely, which was Jeff Kripal's case of uh, in the study of Hinduism, but it was this case of Sam Gill and the Native American case. Um, and the reason, um, I'll, I'll pause just a little bit to share only the beginnings of a story. Um, a friend of mine is now asking at Middlebury as we're doing some interviews, um, the candidates what their racial journey has been, their journey of racial identity has been. Um, to Calvin's earlier points, and I think Ibu, um, you know, in his four slides, puts it so beautifully as well with the interfaith work. 
Um, those folks are on both spiritual journeys as well as racial journeys. Um, it's very um, interesting because white people don't have racial journey stories. Many do not. Um, we do have religious journey stories, but I think we're now beginning to see because of what's happening in our country now, how important it is for us to also under, not only understand our white privilege, but also be in a space where we can share some of the story of our awareness of our own racial identity relative to others and relative to the systems that Calvin was talking about. And so um, my own very brief story is, um, in the context of writing a novel, which I've never published, uh, one of which, uh, one part of which involved the Native American character, um, I began to surreptitiously through stolen hours of the night, do a lot of um, study of the history of Native Americans in my area where I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts. And I learned um, basically of the slow genocide of those people, the woman that lived, and I learned of the woman who probably lived and fished and hunted uh, and grew corn right on the land that I um, uh, myself grew up on in a, in a 18th century farmhouse in, in Salem Village in, near Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and in the course of learning about that uh, group of people, as well as the particular woman who I wanted to be featured in my novel um, and the Native Americans who continue to live in Massachusetts and in um, and descendants of these groups, most of whom have gone to Canada, but some have not, um, I began to become much more aware um, of the responsibility that I had um, to write race and to be related to race differently. Um, and I came up with the idea in the process of writing this novel of something I call racial uh, sorry, literary reparations, which is that white people can in fact only write what they know, but they can write about their own indebtedness differently, indebtedness to other races. Um, and I think that the writing through indebtedness is an incredibly important piece. Um, by total accident, one night I also learned that I was directly descended from the man who stole the land from the Native American woman that I wrote about. Uh, it was around 2 a.m. I will tell the details that next year when we see each other. But uh, as a result of that, it would shook me to the core uh, because I'd already discussed and begun this idea of racial reparations, uh, literary reparations about race. And I suddenly was given my own very specific reparation uh, to write and to think about knowing that I, I was directly descended from that person. And that the house that I lived on was the place, uh, was, was, was stolen from this, from this woman. Um, so that's a small, uh, very small version of, of a racial journey that I have been on. And um, part of that made writing the Sam Gill story incredibly difficult to, um, to do because I, um, Sam Gill is from the University of Chicago where I got my PhD. I knew him. Um, I deeply appreciate um, his commitment to academic freedom. And um, yet I uh, also felt very profoundly an identification with the Native Americans who objected to what was clearly an unintended characterization of Mother Earth. But you can see now in the lens of 2020, the ways in which systemic racism runs through his interpretations of Mother Earth. And he's actually not talking to Native Americans. In the scholarly work that he's doing, he's fighting with white Europeans about what they think Mother Earth is. It's not a fight or even a discussion of Native Americans. It's uh, with Native Americans. And um, so, that's an example of the kind of system that we can see emerging uh, in this case study. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing I would say is that the eruptive public sphere, um, where most of the folks who uh, started to ban, Native American groups who started to ban Sam Gill from coming um, and working with them and studying them and so on, um, were uh, folks who were, um, he was very surprised by this. He hadn't seen it before. And I think it's partly because he hadn't seen the ways in which 
claiming that Mother Earth was something that was part of the negotiations that various groups had with the United States government, which he thought was sympathetic to the Native American groups, was um, in some ways taking away a fundamental understanding um, of their own depth of culture that they felt should be owned by them. Um, and so uh, I think Sam Gill profoundly underestimated the degree to which the public space and the public sphere, both in the Native American context, was the history of eviction, enslavement, and genocide of Native, Native Americans, which made that goodwill Habermasian moment impossible. Um, and uh, I think Sam Gill began to write and wrote earlier in his other books that were less controversial in such a way that he hadn't thought about that pain and he hadn't acknowledged what it would look like for him to write as a white person in a very different context of reflection. Um, part of what I, a lot of people ask me, well, what would you have done in each of these cases? How would you have looked at these scholars' views and so forth? And um, I feel like I owe it to people having written this book to write, to, to write an answer. And one of the things I would say about Sam Gill is that he um, could have written about the fact that um, the idea of Mother Earth was powerful and uh, very powerful in the rhetoric of the Native American groups um, in their negotiations with the United States government without then moving to the next thing, which is therefore she doesn't exist because she doesn't have rituals, she doesn't have traditions, et cetera. The place where um, a more uh, racially just way of thinking would have stopped would have been, maybe I better find out how that statement might be experienced. And maybe I better find out what kinds of depths there actually are in that tradition. Um, and so um, that's where um, I'll end by just saying that part of what was compelling to me about this case study was um, how difficult it was. Um, in most uh, three out of the six case studies, people left the field because of that impossibility the eruptiveness of the public space was so great that the possibility of a public sphere was not able to occur. Uh, Max Pensy, who's a critic of Habermas, is somebody whose work I love, and he talks about um, that um, there are certain kinds of color in religious public conversations where religious people in the public square should make themselves opaque, non-transparent, not translatable, in some way or other. Um, and I think that's a beautiful, um, beautiful phrase. Um, and he, um, I end the book with his, um, with his uh, uh, thinking around that as well. Um, and uh, it's a very powerful quote, um, uh, which uh, talks about um, because of the brokenness of uh, the, 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 the language in the eruptive public space, um, it also can be and become somewhat beautiful. Um, and what I love about that idea is um, that the, the language that scholars can use and the language that we use um, is halting. We don't know. We don't know how to translate. The Habermasian model doesn't work. And so we are always using broken language and broken words. And yet in that brokenness, I think there can emerge a kind of beauty. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Lori. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand it back to Ibu to share a little bit about what IFYC is developing um, to, to assist you and to be in conversation with you about these topics in your classroom. Then we'll look at a few other resources. Um, if we don't get to your questions today, we will be able to facilitate um, a little bit of that later on. All right, so Ibu. Yes, okay. All sorts of awesomeness going on. How, how are my Zoom friends doing? Are, are we okay? All right, okay. So. Um, uh, here, so IFYC is in the development of several high quality online modules that we hope can be both useful as kind of texts on their own and 
especially useful as uh, a set of teaching just simply has to occur online next year, even if campuses are somewhat in residence. We know collectively that there will be more online teaching even on residential campuses. And so um, part of what Calvin will discuss in a minute is the, the online course that IFYC has developed that came out of this, the many years of this seminar that Lori and I have co-facilitated uh, and that was developed in partnership with, uh, with the Luce Foundation. So Calvin and maybe Rob will say a word about that. It's, a, it's kind of an actual course. It's also a set of kind of online videos that can be used as a text for a course. My question for you right now, and I'd love to just kind of see a show of thumbs up uh, or like, um, you know, hands or whatever technological thing you want to do, but IFYC is looking to develop at least two online modules on interfaith leadership and racial justice. One that is roughly along the lines of my presentation, the role of interfaith, uh, the, the, the centrality of, of, of uh, interfaith cooperation to relatively well-known movements for racial justice, civil rights, hints Haraj and the struggle, in kind of a similar way as I presented it. Like, you know, here, here's the inspiration of the people involved. Here's how they shared inspiration. Here are some of the texts that were involved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one uh, along the lines of what Calvin discussed, which is like something, you know, that just needs to be talked about, which is the role that theology plays in constructing white supremacy. Um, uh, and uh, so we're looking at the development of two online modules along those lines. We're good, the, the idea is to develop them in such a way that they would kind of each last for something like a 50 minute course period, right? So, so you could teach them as a, as a single like 11 a.m. to 11.50 course and IFYC might have some staff available to like zoom in to either your Zoom course or your uh, in-person course to kind of lead your students through this module. I just want to get a, a sense from you all, if, the, if, if like just from the, that little information, you think to yourself, boy, that, that's gonna be really useful. I'm gonna slot Carol in or Rob in or Calvin in for 11 a.m. September 18th to, to teach something on uh, 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 interfaith leadership and racial justice. Generally speaking, useful? Okay. Okay, terrific. Thank, thank you for that. I think that's, a, that's enough for us to give it. And, and if, is anybody like, like, in all honesty, like, is anybody super suspicious? Like, you, you, you cats should like, should like, not do that. Anybody super suspicious? Okay. Lori, are you moderately suspicious? No. Not at all. <laughs> no I'm, I'm I'm amused at the way you framed the question. And you guys will see next year, you're going to see us do lots of banter like this. <laughs> oh, we have so much fun. We have so much fun. Okay, uh, Calvin, it is, it is all you. Thank you, Ibu. Um, as we close out, I'll briefly share some other resources that are available to you now. Ibu mentioned one of them. Um, thanks for sharing your screen, Carolyn. So <clears throat> the first being, <clears throat> excuse me, the Interfaith uh, Leadership Video Series. It's an online eight lesson curriculum um, exploring the fundamentals of interfaith leadership created by IFYC and Dominican University. Um, the curriculum can you can see this, Calvin? Can you guys see this? Oh, yes. Okay, this is what the curriculum looks like. Oh. No, I, I can only see the... Um, the PowerPoint. Um, okay, no worries. Keep going. I was trying to show the curriculum. Oh, no worries. Yeah, so the curriculum can be used as a whole or particular modules of interest can be integrated into any of your courses. And of course, we'll be here to help you figure out all of that. Um, in a follow-up email, you'll receive the links to all of this and more detailed information of, 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 the, of how this can, can serve you best. Um, so the second one is the Teaching uh, Interfaith Understanding Library. So it contains syllabi, teaching tactics, and assignment descriptions created by uh, alumni of the CIC and IFYC seminar, so what, what you're a part of now. Um, faculty who have been uh, through the seminar have created these assignments, these syllabi um, 
it's almost 50 resources, including case studies, interviews, site visits, et cetera. Um, so you can browse that and pull out as you need to. And of course, as I said, we'll be here to help you figure out what that looks like if you need it. Um, our Interfaith America site, which was launched back in March, uh, right sort of at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in America and school shutting down. Um, it's a site that is linked uh, from IFYC's main site, um, stories, articles, resources uh, about inspiration and solidarity, community connection, interfaith learning resources, et cetera. Also, uh, some recordings of past webinars that we've done. Uh, there's a webinar on how schools dealt with graduation and commencement uh, during the shelter in place order, et cetera. And you'll receive the link for that as well. There is some great, great uh, articles on there uh, about inspiration and solidarity from scholars and other folks who have wrote about how they are dealing with this and what we can, what we can gain from this time together. Um, there are two upcoming webinars. Um, with Ibu and Lori uh, in August. Um, sorry, Carolyn, can you go to that slide? I skipped ahead. Uh, you'll receive uh, this information and invitations to these. This will be open to our entire network. Um, so once you do receive those, that invitation, please let your colleagues know who may be interested um, in, in anybody else. And then uh, finally, Carolyn, you can go back to that last slide. Uh, we will be offering some grants on interfaith cooperation um, and racial equity. Uh, so classes um, that are, or, or faculty and curriculum development that sits at the intersection of interfaith cooperation and racial equity, and uh, we'll provide more information on that um, later. <clears throat> And then finally, this summer, uh, we will be offering support to you um, individual calls, cohort calls, et cetera, as you develop and revise your courses, um, especially uh, for online adaptation. Uh, areas of support, you can see them there, pedagogical tools and tactics, content resources, et cetera. If you want to take advantage of that, just simply email me, calvin at ifyc.org, and we'll set up a call. And I believe that is it. Carolyn, are you going to close this out? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I was just checking on, we had a couple questions here. Um, we will share the PowerPoints from today. Um, in terms of the modules for the uh, racial justice, racial equity um, courses, Ibu, I believe we're thinking about them as one module for each, or are you thinking about them at, this, this is new, we're in the process of developing, so. Yeah, so we, I am imagining that in the next six weeks, we will have a module that is kind of appropriate for a 50 minute course, which of course you can, you can double click, you can kind of expand yourself, but one module that feels a little bit like my presentation, interfaith cooperation in racial justice movements. And in the, in, within uh, a month or two after that, which is to say, call it September, October, we will have at least one more module on something along the lines of, of uh, interfaith cooperation and, and, and white supremacy. So the racial justice you, movements Mike. will come out first. Thank you, Ibu. So um, we're going to look for opportunities to, to facilitate a little bit more conversation since we didn't have time for questions. I, we do have a couple minutes, so I just want to ask if there's any questions specifically about ways that IFYC can support you or the next year or other resources that we have. Or any other kind of quickish questions. Um, yeah, sorry, Kayla's question, there any kind of syllabus sharing program? Uh, so typically, yes, as part of the, as part of, 
let me explain. So one, um, the Teaching Interfaith Understanding Seminar Library, which is on IFOC's website, is a collection of syllabi that have been collated over the past seven years that we've done this, seven or eight years we've done this. Um, so you can find some there. When we meet together, what we have done in the past is you all contribute syllabi and then you workshop them together. If there's an interest in sharing those as you're working on them this year, Calvin and I can figure out a way to do that over the course of the year so you can begin those conversations before we get together next summer. And um, one thing that is really kind of cool about this that I'm thinking about now, I mean, it's frustrating because it there's nothing like a um, kind of interactive engagement on and sort of larger reflection on questions about civic space that either uses our public sphere. Um, but I think uh, we will have the advantage of having a little bit of time, prep time on Zoom before we actually meet, um, which is a pedagogical model that many people in immersive learning experiences actually suggest is that there's a lot of online prep time before you deep dive into an immersive learning experience. So I think that's going to be really wonderful for people as well. Um, I just uh, offered to Caroline um, that if I know there were some, I got some great questions about the book. Um, if people are interested in um, meeting again and if IFYC does, if wants to host it specifically to have a conversation um, about the, current, the stuff that came up today, um, I'm certainly willing to do that next week. If people, um, if people are available. Lori, Calvin and I will, will set, will email and get a sense of whether that will work for folks and um, we'll Perfect. set that up. Okay. Yep. That Thank you for great. that offer. We appreciate it a lot. Absolutely. Um, Thank you all for your time this afternoon. I apologize that we didn't get to all the, that we didn't get to the questions, but as I said, the, the benefit of postponing a year is that we can do a little bit of uh, backwards design and um, do some of this content work first before we get together in the room. Um, so be well, please look out for the email from Calvin and I. We especially want you to look out for emails that tell you about the upcoming grant opportunities, as well as upcoming webinars, as well as the upcoming curriculum. So, and, and as always, if you have any questions or if you're just wondering if we have something, email us. And if we do, we'll get it to you. If we're the wrong people, we'll get you to the right people. Um, so thank you all. Thank you abundantly to Lori for your time today and we look forward to seeing you all again.